sincerely uh, hope that it's a very strong test. A road test or written test? Both. Both, okay. We would hope that uh, included in, in, in part of the uh, requirements is a medical re examination uh, report. We have at one time, uh, and I think your committee has it, uh, when we, you heard this bill first, outlined some of the proposed uh, tests that ought to be used for testing these type of drivers. I can also tell you that uh, Mr. McKellar, who had to leave the room, wanted me to say that his uh, association, the Log Truckers Association, does support this. Yes, uh, thank you. I have a note from him uh, saying that he has um, too many things <laughs> piled into one morning and can't uh, stay here, but that they do want to support uh, the bill, and I believe we do have some printed testimony from him that we can put into the record as well. He will appreciate that, Madam okay. Chair. Uh, we find no fault with the today's proposed amendments by the division, uh, one that would eliminate the requirement of air brakes as a separate issue. Uh, we believe that every brake on every truck, any kind of a brake, the driver ought to be able to uh, be, and be capable of knowing all about that particular brake, not just air brakes. The uh, removal of the hazardous materials is good because there's so many agent, other agencies, including the federal government, that is involved in that. Uh, and the others are typographical. I have not had a chance this morning to really go through um, the last draft of 213. But it's I am the same certain. as it was by the <coughs> those amendments. Yeah, it's, the same as one of it's, it's, about it's the same um, bill as it was before, except for the amendments that we went over when we all met together to discuss the, the new amendment. That's why I'm sure that we can accept that draft. Okay. Again, I guess in closing, Madam Chair and members of the committee, the Oregon Trucking Association uh, fully supports this idea. We want those drivers to be absolutely qualified if they're out on the highway. We uh, will hope that the rules and regulations adopted by the division are um, strict and good rules and that in some way the interim committee task force, the legislature will audit the continuation of this program if you adopt the bill so that you know exactly what the division is doing in the interim period and getting prepared for this. It would be my intention to ask for, uh, if, if we are uh, going to have an interim uh, uh, transportation committee, that we ask for regular reports and then we will also make sure that people who are interested are on the mailing list to be notified to, uh, to know when the hearings are about that. I believe that's all that I have here this morning. I certainly will try to answer any questions. Are there any questions? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, there, I don't have anyone else signed up to testify on this bill, and we are in a work session. Is the committee? I move the amendments number three. Thank you, Senator Simmons. Moves the amendments to Senate Bill 213 that are 213-3 from Legislative Council, dated 422-85. Is there any discussion? Ma Madam Chair, Senator, I noticed in here the age. Uh, Section and you probably understand the age requirements. Do we? Uh, I get back to the, the farming situation again in, in regards to age requirements for class uh, three. And the way I I just glanced at it here now, I've lost where I saw it. Where where are you? Age thirty-one. Eighteen. Page eighteen. Oh, you're on page 18. Currently, we have special situations for individuals, right? Mm hmm A certain age. Do we, under this program, do we lose that when we go to a class three? I don't think we're making any changes in that. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't think of that sooner. But okay. <clears throat> Dennis? Okay. Yeah, Madam Chair, Senator, Tim, you talk about the minimum age for... Right. Uh, under the age person or I'm talking about the minimum age to obtain a class three driver's license okay 18 which is what it is for a chauffeur's license now 18 okay. mm -hmm. mm. 
Now, is there any way that they can get it temporary, say somebody working in the, in the field, in the hay field or what have you, that's driving a class three truck where they can have it temporary under age of 18? A special. Special we, permit type thing. Well, we have the special permits available for persons who are at least 14 uh, for emergency purpose, student permits. I don't, I'm not sure that's what you're talking about. Yes, that's what I'm talking about. Oh, yeah, that's still available. That's still available under a class three license? Under a class four license in the bill. Mm -hmm. Not under a class three. You wouldn't have a license to drive in field anyway, would you? If you well, but if you probably go out on the highway in some cases. Presently, for a one of the emergency permits, uh, they are limited to driver type vehicles and my vehicles they can only drive the driver's license. Yeah, I understand where you're at in class four. I'm not sure one a 14 year old driving a class three, but maybe a 16 year old. You know, you're going to do away with some jobs for, for students, huh? but they can't have a license to drive it that size vehicle. Mm -hmm. sure. Senator Fry. I do agree with Senator James on that. Now. Yeah. I think that there are just an awful lot of 16 and 17 year olds out there. Oh, sure. <coughs> if this bill, in fact, does say that they can't <coughs> do what they've been doing, I think we ought to change It's a good it. question. We have the Farm Bureau testify, Madam Chair. I don't think we have it. Have we? No. <coughs> did Did you, Vanita? Vanita, would you come up and, and help address this also? We've had several also? conversations with the farm community. We, I don't know that we anybody raised that before. Yesterday for 45 minutes. Oh. <laughs> Madam <laughs> Chair, that's Senator, a good question, Vanita. Senator Timms, uh, we have discussed with the Farm Bureau and the uh, cattlemen's people the bill per se, but. Frankly, that question has not come up uh, about the 16 and 17 year old on a class three license. Um, but it's a good question. It is a good question. Uh, clearly now, the, if they drive for hire or if they're transporting people or goods, uh, they're, they're supposed to be 18 now to get a chauffeur's license. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, you know, I think you might be you might be lowering down uh, the age standard uh, for at least some people. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm trying to Go think ahead. out loud, but I, I'm not too sure about if you allow a 16-year-old or a 17-year-old who has just barely learned to drive an automobile. <coughs> Uh, it is a different situation, I can see it in a farm area, but I'm not sure what you do if you allow that 16 or 17 year old to operate that class of vehicle uh, in a city. Well, ma'am, ma'am, chair. Sure. Maybe there's. But I bet they are. You know? no, no, I know they are. <laughs> I mean, some of them maybe even learned how to drive on that kind of a vehicle and in some cases. Ma'am, chair, sure, it may well also be that some of them do get chauffeur's licenses. Uh, no, they can't get it no. until 18. So they're, if they're doing it, they're doing it illegally now. I see. That's the question I was going to ask. Yeah. Currently, yeah. they so have to have a chauffeur's license to drive. Uh, for hire. A, for hire. Mm -hmm. If they are principally employed to transport people or goods or for hire, they must have a chauffeur's license. So and that doesn't change. That And, and to and get a chauffeur's license, you have to be 18. What been as proposed in this bill is that you at the class three on up correct you would have to be 18 which would be mm -hmm. the, uh, the the two-year level what if you're a member of the family <coughs> if you have a you're not then for hire so you could uh, drive the vehicle well madam chair senator Timms, this concept is getting rid of that idea of quote for hire that's one of the prime <coughs> forces or prime reasons for classified <coughs> licenses is to eliminate your license status uh, from being what you do, rather we're trying to get what at you what you drive. Yeah. I don't know, I'd be glad to 
books more at, at that age factor uh, or whatever the chair would like. Well, I, if we have it a, is problem, a new I question, think we need to clear up what the <clears throat> problem is. Dennis? M Madam Chair, I might mention Dennis says that his checks with other states indicate that Class 3 on, and on up are 18 in those states. So. Well, but the, the yeah. question of a job yeah. right now, it's still parallel. I guess the other question is if it's uh, a family member or someone. Madam Chair, I think what we might go back and take a look at would be the question of whether there could be some kind of temporary okay. class three or something like that, but I think that's I'd, I'd rather or not or it, it coming under mm -hmm. a special uh, situation. Between 16 and 18 mm -hmm. under Be Between 16 and 18 under special circumstances? Is I, I that don't possible now under the other conditions for the special um, permit? No. Uh, Madam Chair, presently if the person is driving where he's not required to be a chauffeur, you know, he's not transporting persons or property or for hire or hire specifically to drive a motor vehicle, he might drive any type of vehicle at age 16. But if he comes under the definition of chauffeur, then he has to be 18 to drive that vehicle. So under the bill as proposed, uh, the person, if they wanted to drive a class three vehicle, would have to be 18. Mm -hmm. So, so that, that is uh, a change in the situation. So uh, what's the best way of addressing that? Well, Madam Chair, we'd have to address it with an amendment if the committee is so disposed to reduce the age for or to create a create special permit situation. Special permit, and I, I'd like to uh, have some time to look at the uh, what we might have to do on that. With uh, possible time restraints on it, I'd think, you know, yeah. six months or something like that. So it's not seasonal. There, mm -hmm. yeah. seasonal. there are provisions in the bill for instruction permits, but not that kind of thing. Um, I think we would have to take a look and see just where we could come from. Whether you want us to uh, do that now. Um, oh, I think that it needs to. I think that it and needs to be looked it. at. It's a, it's a yeah. distinct. Yeah. Uh, it, it's a change in the situation. <coughs> there needs to be mm -hmm. something looked at for it. Madam Chair, Senator Simmons, could I amend my motion to adopt the amendments to say, uh, with a conceptually to put in a. Uh, okay an emergency type permit for 16 to 18. I would say a special permit. Special permit, 16 to 18, okay. or 16 to 17, to uh, operate uh, a class three. Class three vehicles, or class three license. Okay, we can do that in concept. Madam Chair, may I ask you you one question? Would that concept be limited to certain uh, Rural situations, or would that be across the board? County. <laughs> <laughs> Seven counties. <laughs> um, <laughs> we could limit it to agricultural <coughs> pursuits, uh, which presumably aren't uh, using the highways as much. I would hate mm -hmm. to see a 16-year-old kid driving a truck down the Thunder River Gorge or down I-5. That was my concern, Madam Chair. Yeah. Does, does that uh, concept uh, for an amendment to the amendment sound like the direction the committee wants to go? Okay. Madam Chair. Senator Monroe. The, the more limited, the better, as far as I'm concerned, in terms of that special permit. 16-year-old uh, kids driving big rigs in traffic scares me. Yeah, well, this, would, this is, we only talking about your class, class three, three now, yeah. not your big, big. Well, yeah, class, class three vehicle is a pretty good sized vehicle. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> class three in an agricultural um, situation. Madam Chair, yeah. and they would still require to be tested. 
even though they were the six, there wouldn't be oh, yeah. a dispensation. Oh, well, you're not going to make a dispensation right. for right. a particular set of people when everybody, when the whole purpose of the thing is to test people in the vehicle, mm -hmm. they're going to drive. Sure, it's okay. These farmers have been cheating all these years. <laughs> <laughs> all right, if there isn't any objection to that concept, right to these amendments, that's adopted as um, conceptually amended. Now, what's the, the safest way to go from here? Do you want to go ahead and um, move, move the bill with those amendments to be drafted that way? I think it would be a fairly simple amendment. Okay. I think the committee's very clear, and I stated it precisely the way we'd like to have that done. Madam Chairman. Senator Fry. To give staff a little better direction, I, I would suggest that uh, if it's going to be limited pretty much to agricultural pursuits, so we also include in their language that uh, to this, something to this effect, where, where most of the driving is done off of the highway uh, in, in, a, in an agricultural situation where most of the driving is, is not done on the highway. What I'm thinking of is that uh, if you just say agricultural pursuits, I suppose that would allow a 16-year-old to haul hay across the mountains on some regular basis. Or, uh, that's not what you got in mind. If they're not being it paid for it. Huh? <laughs> if they're not being paid for it. Well, I guess it doesn't make any difference under this thing whether right. they get paid for it or not. Oh, okay. Used to be. Uh, well, you see what I mean is I... Mm -hmm. sure. Occasionally, as Senator uh, uh, Tim says, the, the young driver in the, who's most of his work is in the field, but maybe he has to drive the uh, maybe he has to drive the truck to the uh, to the elevator, uh, to unload the uh, grain, for example, or whatever. And, but it principally, uh, he's driving off of the highway. I'm right. not worried, but that's my idea. I'm I'm just just limited, but limited <laughs> <to> <laughs> unpaid yeah, yeah, that would take care of a good deal of says that it will be drafted as tightly as possible to address those concerns. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, are you comfortable with that? Senator Monroe. Could we could we have agreement that those amendments will be supplied to committee members and that if there's objection or concerns of committee members that we bring the bill back? I have absolutely no idea. problem with that whatsoever. Uh, each and every committee member will have a set of the amendments and uh, they'll be flagged with a large goldenrod piece of paper. <laughs> and uh, uh, even before the committee report is completed, I think. Yes. Okay. And if, if there is a problem, we will... Uh, yes, Mr. Knight. Without going through, Madam Chair, <coughs> the printed uh, and uh, growth bill here, can you tell me or are you planning to adopt an amendment submitted today by the division? We are planning to adopt um, a uh, LC 213-3. Are they included in yes. that? Yes, all of, all of the amendments pre previous to this that we had drafted that were my amendments that rewrote the bill plus uh, the, the amendments that we discussed in our meetings are in 213-3. And at this point, we're talking about the conceptual amendment on the Class 3 uh, special uh, permit for someone under between 16 and 18 uh, in an agricultural situation. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, is, is there any objection to adopting the amendments as we've addressed them? So ordered. Uh, Senator Simmons moves Senate Bill 213 to the floor with a due pass as amended recommendation. Is there some more discussion? Sharon, please call the roll. Senator Brenneman? Aye. Senator Hanlon? Aye. Senator Monroe? Aye. Senator Simmons? Aye. Senator Sims? Aye. Senator Fry? Aye. Senator Seath? Aye. I will carry it and we will make sure that everyone, including anyone who is in the audience as well, is able to see the amendments uh, before it goes to the desk. Thank you all for your work on what is one of, I think, one of the more important bills from this committee for the session.
Um, okay. Let's go to... Um, uh, I guess we'll just go right down the numbers here. Uh, is that the way we've decided to do this, yes. Carol? Okay. Next bill is a public hearing and possible work session on House Bill 2176. Um, Mr. Matthew. Good morning. Madam Chair, members of the committee, Mr. Adams, maintenance highway engineer, was called to Eastern Oregon. I am here to testify in his place. My name is Richard Matthew. I am outdoor advertising control supervisor, the highway division, and I'm here to testify in support of House Bill 2176. This bill clarifies the department's responsibility to remove illegal signs off the highway right of way the, by defining specifics that the signs are a nuisance. In many cases, these signs actually cause a safety hazard because they are blocked the sight distance. The property owners put, put them too close to the highway and motors entering the highway from the, that property have difficulty doing doing so safely. Use of these signs are usually in a major thoroughfare like McLaughlin Boulevard or the Coast Highway. These signs increase safety problems on those highways with high volume thoroughfares. It has been difficult for our field personnel to administer the law to eliminate signs illegally placed on highway right-of-way. Portable signs have been a particular thorn in the side of our maintenance personnel. Sign owners simply roll their portable signs into the highway right-of-way and then move them back at will. This bill will alleviate this condition. <coughs> Is there any questions? Does anyone have any questions? Madam Chair, I assume Senator a lot Senator. of this is aimed at political signs. I'm not so sure it's aimed so much at political signs as it is some of the um, uh, the portable uh, for sale vehicle for sale signs or things like that. That was at least what came up last session. Yeah. Madam Chair, Senator Tams, this is Senator. mainly these portable signs on wheels that they just roll out on our highway right away and could get clear out on the highway right away and block the distance from the people pulling out from a side street in which they are illegal, illegal to do so, to move them beyond their property line. Now, this is a fairly large uh, vehicle with 30 ditch wheels, for example, or a roller skate type wheels. Well, these are many sizes, 4x8 or 4x6 or 3x6 is most common, with these flashing arrows, mm -hmm. and they, uh, they cause many problems. The, for example, you'll have a service station on one corner and a, another service station on the other corner, and they keep moving the signs out until they get, in some cases, cleared the fog line. I, I guess this I... Is, our Washington County people are more civilized. I have <laughs> noticed too much of that. <laughs> it's only in Tim, County. <laughs> Go ahead. Senator Tim, the Washington County is working on Simmons. this encroachment problem at this time. I've talked with them. <laughs> are there more questions for Mr. Matthew? Yeah. Is the uh, committee... Uh, I don't have anyone else who has signed up to uh, testify. Does the committee uh, want to do something with this bill? Think about it. <coughs> Senator Fry moves. Um, I, I just don't think it's quite strong enough. <laughs> you don't think it's strong enough? Okay. House Bill 2176 to the floor with the due pass recommendation. Is there more discussion? Uh, may I just ask you? <coughs> Senator Brindley, please just do. Just outside the city? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I uh, stepped out there for a minute. I just had a question about it being outside city limits. Uh, 
Mr. Matthew, you want to answer that question? Madam Chair, uh, Senator Brennan, uh, I'm, you <coughs> were, we were speaking inside or outside either one, but our major problems are out in the areas which has a dense population, normally outside the city limits because the cities are quite restrictive in many cases. So is that well, but, but it, it... It would affect all the signs that would encroach on highway right away, yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I have a, a question which is indirectly related to the bill. You're the Outdoor Advertising Control Supervisor. How many people does DOT have uh, employed in this kind of thing? I mean, how many, how many people do you supervise in your Outdoor Advertising Control? Uh, directly, there are just four of us. But, however, we do receive reports from all the field offices throughout the state. And it takes four, four people to uh, pick up outdoor advertising that's on the right of way? Uh, when you're speaking of, we're speaking of control supervisor, we're talking about billboards, on-premise signs, directional signs, business identification signs. This is for keeping them under permit. We issue permits for on-premise signs outside the incorporated city statewide. You mean uh, if it's alongside the highway or it's visible, visible to the state highway? So if I've got a, a, a barn, I can't put up a Lydia Pinkham sign on the side of the barn without a permit? This is true. Maybe if you're outside the incorporated city and it is not an on-premise sign. Would you be conducting the business at, in your barn? Maybe. Okay, that would be an on-premise sign. You would need a permit to do so. Also a license to practice medicine. Well, <laughs> 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 to remember. Well, um, but that, that's, that's not anything that this bill addresses. That's just no, I, I'm just deal. curious about the, the size of the operation just to control advertising outdoors and... Uh, um, now, is I, that funded from transportation funds? Yes. Is that considered maintenance and construction of highway? We're under maintenance. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Sunderman. Um, is are there any further questions about this this bill, um, Senator? Oh, we already did that. Senator Fry had moved 2176 to the floor with a due pass recommendation, and we were just doing further discussion. Any more discussion? Sharon, would you please call the roll? Senator Brenneman. I'm Chief Brenneman. Mm -hmm. Aye. Sen Senator Simmons. Aye. Senator Timms. Aye. Senator Fry. Aye. Senator Cease. Aye. Senator Brenneman, could I ask you to carry this bill? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay. <coughs> okay. Uh, we're going to go to a hearing on House Bill 2194. I'd like to call Mr. Russell from the Public Utility Commission to testify. <coughs> Good morning, Madam Good morning. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Bob Russell. I'm Deputy Assistant Commissioner, PUC Motor Carrier Program. Okay. HB 2194, as amended, proposes to implement an optional flat fee for vehicles weighing 26,000 pounds or less. This fee would be paid to PUC at the beginning of each year or on a quarterly basis. Trucks using gasoline would pay an annual flat fee of $165. Those burning diesel would pay $410. Presently, there is a graduated flat fee schedule that is applicable to vehicles with a combined weight of 18,000 pounds or less. It was established in 1953. A flat fee will simplify reporting and record keeping activities for motor carriers, thereby reducing their costs. Also, PUC auditing efforts will be reduced for these vehicles. As a result, more time and effort can be devoted to carriers with larger weight vehicles who pay proportionally more highway use taxes. This will enhance PUC audit efficiency. PUC records show that the 
that the total 184,086 vehicles registered with the state as of January 1985, 15,842 have a weight of 26,000 pounds or less. This represents 8.6% of total vehicles. However, the smaller vehicles pay only 2.2% of the total highway use tax <coughs> collected. This bill also proposes to exempt from PUC regulation vehicles that are operated prior to the time they are put into commercial service. This would apply to a dealer or manufacturer delivering a vehicle to a carrier's place of business. Another example would be a prospective purchaser test driving a vehicle. Historically, these operations have been treated as exempt by PUC. However, a recent opinion of the Attorney General's office indicates that highway use tax is required. An insignificant amount of tax would be lost to the highway fund. This proposed exemption would be consistent with the current exemption applicable to the relocation of equipment for truck leasing companies. Another purpose of this bill is to exempt from PUC regulation vehicles designed to be used primarily in an off-road capacity. In the past, most of these vehicles were considered to be exempt from regulation as well. It is now felt that they are taxable. The exemptions wording ensures that operation on the public highways is in fact incidental to the off-road use. Examples of these vehicles would be large construction machinery and certain agricultural equipment. Again, there would be negligible impact on the highway fund. Our trucks, for one thing, and I think we're missing uh, the uh, theory of uh, pay-as-you-go for trucks by not collecting the gas tax on diesel as well as on gasoline. Let me ask that you um, meet <coughs> together with Senator Simmons and um, go over the figures with him. This bill has a subsequent referral to revenue also, so um, it will be scrutinized there as well <coughs> by several of us on this committee. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe if we did some more homework first, it would make it easier for revenue to... Uh, okay. We'll yeah, we will, we will uh, happily reschedule the bill. Okay. Is, does anybody else have any more um, questions for either of these people? And um, John, let me ask you about your suggested what what you're you're suggesting amendments that would restore on page five the language um, from lines four to twenty five and add uh, additional levels to those two tables, right? Madam Chair, that's correct. Yes. Okay. I think you need to talk about those figures also when you talk to Senator Simmons. Okay? Right. Thank you very much. Is there anybody else who wants to be heard on this bill? Okay, we'll close the uh, hearing on House Bill 2194 and um, go to a uh, hearing and possible work session on House Bill 2195. Now I have to <coughs> warn people that we, we need to be on the floor at 10 o'clock I don't, I suspect that there's going to be a lot of discussion on House Bill 2199, and um, I have a feeling we really ought to um, reschedule that unless we, in order to give it the proper attention. Um, so I'm going to suggest that we, that we reschedule uh, a hearing on House Bill 2199 um, for I assume it will be sometime next week. Next Wednesday. Next Wednesday, probably, but um, check with Carol for sure on that. Okay, Bob, you're just sitting there because you're going to come in on the other bill. And we're now in a hearing and possible work session on House Bill 2195. Thank you. <clears throat> this bill accomplishes two things. <clears throat> the first is to allow PUC to collect temporary pass fees through highway use tax audit assessments. The second is to allow PUC to collect a $150 fee from carriers who request a hearing in highway use tax assessment cases and then fail to appear for the hearing. <coughs> At present, if a carrier fails to obtain a temporary pass when traveling through the state, 
PUC cannot collect the past fee at a later time through a tax audit. The actual tax, however, is collected. Prior to 1983, it had been <coughs> PUC policy to include the un unpaid temporary pass fee in the audit assessment. But an informal Attorney General's opinion held that there is no statutory, statutory authority to do so. Mm, okay. Highway use tax audits for 1983 indicate that PUC can expect to receive approximately $30,000 in additional annual revenue if this proposal is adopted. PUC believes that carriers who illegally avoid paying highway use taxes should be held accountable not only for the taxes, but also for the temporary pass fees. This legislation would provide the statutory authority for us to do that. The second portion of this measure would assess a $150 fee to petitioners requesting hearings in highway use tax assessment cases who then fail to appear at time of hearing and fail to give us five days notice prior to the hearing. After an audit assessment is made for payment of highway use tax, the carrier can petition the commissioner for reassessment. If the petitioner requests a hearing, PUC has to grant it. PUC incurs considerable, considerable expense for such hearings. Preparation of the case is costly and includes the expense of a hearings examiner, an assistant attorney general, an auditor, and occasionally a hearings reporter. Additional costs are incurred when travel is involved. During 1983, there were 16 in instances where carriers failed to appear at reassessment hearings without giving prior no notice of intent to withdraw. At present, <coughs> when a carrier protests an application for authority, which is a different type of hearing, <coughs> that will cause a hearing. And if he fails to appear, by statute, we have the ability to, to fine him $150. This bill simply proposes that we be able to do that in assessment cases as well as application cases. Are there questions for Mr. Russell? Does, does it happen often that somebody fails to appear? It's becoming more and more frequent. And this is after they've actually asked for it. <clears throat> they have, once we file an assessment for highway use tax, they have 30 days in which to appeal. <clears throat> and then we have to set the hearing if they, in fact, appeal. And we have to give them a 10 days notice of the hearing. And with our hearings docket, it's frequently two to three months from the time that they appeal that they actually get a hearing. And in a lot of cases, what's happening is there's no intention of appealing the, a highway use tax assessment. It's just additional time that they gain before they actually have to pay the tax. Are there questions? Madam Chair, um, if Representative Harper were here, he would ask how you give the notice of the hearing, the 10 day notice. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Simmons, uh, Representative Harper did ask that. <laughs> <laughs> we actually send out a written notice of hearing by two. <laughs> By mail. Mm -hmm. That's correct. And it <laughs> takes sometimes eight days to get from Salem to Helix. <laughs> <laughs> that is correct. So the uh, petitioner then, if he uh, had the illness and for some reason couldn't appear, would be automatically subject to a $150 fine. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Simmons, that's not the way we do it. <clears throat> if he would call us and tell us that he has a problem, we would be happy to reschedule. Our only concern is the person that's, that forces us to schedule a hearing with absolutely no intention of going through with it. We want to give everyone that, that truly wants to contest a tax assessment the opportunity to do so. And we will work with them every way we possibly can to provide that opportunity. Well, actually though, if it took the uh, seven days to get the notice to Helix, uh, Representative Harper wouldn't have time within the five days to notify you that there would be, according to the law at least, uh, he has to uh, notify you five days before the hearing, and his notice comes three days before. Madam Chair, Senator Simmons, that is correct. However, <clears throat> we would take into consideration the fact that he didn't receive it until three days prior to the hearing, and we would in fact accommodate that situation. So you would violate the law then? <laughs> well, I, my point is that I think this time frame is, is uh, uh, a little tight. 
Okay. Uh, is it possible to give more than 10 days' notice of the hearing? Madam Chair, Senator Simmons, we most often give much more than 10 days' notice. Frequently, because of our crowded hearings schedule, they will have six weeks' notice, sometimes two months prior to the scheduling of the hearing. We have not had any difficulty with people being notified and not receiving notification of hearing until <clears throat> it was either too late or until there was very little time for which they for them to prepare for the hearing. Well, shouldn't there be something in here then, unless there is good cause that they pay that hundred and fifty dollars, or unless they have a reasonable excuse? Well, I uh, think section two takes care of that, doesn't it? On lines thirty-two. To Right, page two. Page two, line thirty-two. Does does that cover what well, you? You may reduce the waiver, reduce the interest, interest and penalties. And penalties. And the new language in subsection four takes then, care of it because it makes it permissive for the commissioner to require the payment of a charge of one hundred and fifty dollars. It says may. It may require. Okay. That is correct. Okay. Okay. Correct. Gotcha. Well, Which may be imposed. Okay. Well, I, I, I guess I would like assurance that if there is a reasonable cause, you would not require the $150. Madam charge. Chair, Senator Simmons, that is correct. We would not. <clears throat> we're, only, we're only attempting to address the person that would uh, request an assessment or an assessment hearing uh, uh, frivolously. That's what we're after. Uh, with that in the record, yeah, I think that's pretty clearly on the record as to how they're going to handle this. If you got by Representative Harper, why? <laughs> <laughs> we get mail service in Tigard usually within three days of, of, from Salem. Okay. I have no one further signed up to testify on this. Is there any more discussion on it? Senator Fry moves House Bill 2195 to the floor with a due pass recommendation. Further discussion? Sharon, please call the roll. Senator Brenham. Aye. Senator Simmons. Aye. Senator Tim. Aye. Senator Fry. Aye. And Senator Seat. Aye. <laughs> Senator Fry, what's the chance of your carrying I'll this do it. bill? Thanks. Aye. Trying to even up the list here. <laughs> okay. Thank you, everyone. I don't think Thank there's you. anything further to come before us, and so we are adjourned. <laughs> Were you standing there waving no, it because no, you wanted no, to say something on this bill? I had one of the oral on the lines of, of what uh, Senator Simmons was. Oh, on this there. other one? Is it?